Good evening. Thanks, Chris. What a joyful, joyful sound that is. Well, welcome to Philippians. Um, as I read and studied the book of Philippians over the past few months, uh, I'm reminded of the day of my salvation and really every day since. I recall the unmistakable joy that was present within me. It was a joy that I had never known. It was and is a supernatural joy. And that joy has never left me or ever will. So, as we uh, open up to Philippians, uh, let's pray and we'll learn more about the gift of joy. Father, thank you for your grace. It is through your grace that we can experience the presence of your Holy Spirit within us. And when your Holy Spirit indwells our hearts and brings us the gifts of joy and peace. Father, we are pro so privileged to be a part of you, to be in your family, and to know of your love. We just praise you, Father. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, I think most will agree that the letter of, to the Philippians is one of the most joyous books in the Bible. Paul, the author, speaks 16 times in four brief chapters of his inner joy. He also mentions Christ 40 times. So we can easily conclude that his joy is found in Christ as so is our joy. As we go through the introduction to this book, uh, we're going to look at the circumstances that surrounded Paul and how he disciplined himself to rejoice in the Lord always. As we examine the world that we live in, most will say that it is a place filled with turmoil, hatred, despair, depression, and discontentment. It is a sad reality. For unbelievers, there is no hope that anything will change. Long years of life become long years of sorrow, briefly interrupted by moments of happiness, and these moments of happiness become less frequent as aging takes place. So how do we distinguish between the joy expressed by Paul in the book of Philippians, a joy that is found in Christ versus the happiness that is known by the world? Well, first, let's define happiness. It is an attitude of satisfaction or delight based upon some present circumstance. Happiness is related to happenings. This thought basically conveys the idea that happiness occurs by chance. You can't plan on it that it will occur, or even how long it'll last. It's elusive, fleeting, and there is no hope that it's going to occur again. Joy, on the other hand, must be understood in a biblical sense. Joy is a permanent possession of every believer, not just happiness that comes and goes based on circumstances. This joy is much different than the happiness experienced by the world, and we must remember that happiness is a response to circumstance, but joy is a confidence that is built on a relationship with Christ. True joy is unwavering. It is a constant in a spirit-filled life. It's not produced by a bed of roses experience or tranquility or peace or safety, comfort. It is produced by the presence of God and His Holy Spirit. Even if you're sitting in prison, waiting for a, the possible news about your execution, as Paul was. 
He had joy, which was a result of his eternal relationship with the living God through Jesus Christ and the ministry of the Holy Spirit within him. And because he was so near to God, he was filled with joy. Circumstances aren't a factor, but instead, it is your nearness to God that determines your joy. In John 15, 11, Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. Christ came to proclaim the gospel that would give men joy. Romans 14, 17 says, The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Another key element of true joy is that it is even present in trials. You will never experience the reality of this kind of joy unless it is made very clear by contrast to trials. James commands us, Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. And the words of Peter in 1 Peter 1.6 in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. In other words, you have not experienced the fullness of joy in your salvation unless you have gone through a contrast of trials. Peter sums, sums it up well in 1 Peter 1.8, writing to persecuted Christians. He said, And though you have not seen him, that is Christ, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. This is the theme of the book of Philippians, the believer's joy. It is an epistle of joy. Paul is writing to the Philippians. He loves the Philippians, and the Philippians love him. What are the circumstances that are surrounding Paul in his writing of this book? Well, we must remember that Paul is writing this letter during the last years of his life. Paul is in prison in Rome, and the longer he is in prison, the more imminent that he might face execution for his stand for Jesus. In a commentary by James Boyce, he says this, It was not generally recognized how poorly Paul had been received in Rome. When he read the book of Roman, when you when we read the book of Romans, we think that the church that had received this letter would owe undying gratitude to the man who wrote it. But although this should have been true, it was certainly not the case. Luke tells us that when Paul arrived in Rome as a prisoner, he went many went out to meet him, just as we might go to the airport to meet a celebrity. But then Paul went to prison. Two years passed, maybe more. The pastors were jealous of Paul. They neglected him for that reason. And when pastors neglect their duty, the people forget also. In time, Paul was almost forgotten. And the proof of this lies in the fact that Onesiphorus, a visitor to Rome, tried to find Paul some years later. No one could tell him where Paul was. It was only by careful searching that this faithful Christian found him. It was a difficult time for Paul. It was made more difficult by trusted friends who abandoned him in his hour of need. 2 Timothy 1.15 says, You know that everyone in the presence of Asia has deserted me, including Phagellus, and homogenous. We also see jealous Christians in Philippians 1, 15 through 18. Let's turn there and read that with me. Verse 15, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, 
and in this I rejoice. Paul's response was not one of distress, but one of rejoicing because these so-called Christians were not pure in motive. But his mission was being accomplished in that the gospel was being proclaimed and his response was to rejoice. Paul was alone in a Roman prison and except for Timothy, Epaphroditus, and a few other visitors, or a few other friends, Paul had few visitors. In contrast, because of the love of the Philippians, the Philippians had for Paul, they sent Epaphroditus with gifts for Paul to minister to him. Look with me at Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Paul is sending Epaphroditus back to the Philippians. He says, But I thought it necessary to send you to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. And you don't have to turn there, but in Philippians 4.18 it says, But I have received everything in full and have, a, and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Again, we can see how special the relationship is between Paul and the Philippian church. Paul's unquenchable and constant joy, even during torment, tormented suffering, is the pulse of this joy-filled letter. The joy that Paul or other Christian experiences is that some are fleeting emotional feelings that lifts you up one moment and drops you the next, depending on the circumstances. Paul was filled with joy despite any of these circumstances. The same should be true for all of us as believers. One other thought before we move into the text of Philippians. The book reveals in a special way the mind of Paul. And who doesn't want to be inside the mind of the Apostle Paul? He was writing this letter during the last two years of his life, alone in prison, knowing that his execution was highly probable. And yet his mind was filled with peace and rejoicing regarding the efforts that had been made in sharing the gospel. How is it possible for Paul to have joy in these circumstances? Well, this is how. Because Paul had his mind filled to the fullness with Christ. One commentator said, the human mind cannot think of two things at once. You can't be thinking about the pain in your back in the same moment that you're thinking about Crepe Suzette. Similarly, you cannot be thinking about your problems in the same moment that you're thinking about Jesus Christ. This Paul knew. He knew it theoretically and he knew it practically. And consequently, he had filled his mind with Christ. He goes on to add, in the same way, we should be so preoccupied with Christ that we see Him in everything. In nature, in human relationships, in our triumphs, also in our sorrows. To be filled with Christ is the secret of real Christian living. It is the secret of true happiness. Paul's mind was filled with Christ rather than his circumstances and we can support this by observing that the name of Christ, or Jesus Christ, appears 17 times in chapter 1 alone. So let's begin. What was Paul's purpose or purposes in constructing this epistle? Well, first, it is obvious in chapter 1, verses 3 through 8, and then again in chapter 4, 10 through 18, that Paul wanted to express his love and thanks to the Philippians for their gift to him. Secondly, is that he wanted the Philippians to know his reasoning for returning Epaphroditus to them. He did not want them to think that his service to Paul was unsatisfactory. This is clearly stated in 
chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. Another purpose in writing was to give the Philippians an update concerning his circumstances at Rome and, with most, as with most of Paul's letters to the saints, he was writing to warn them of false teachers. So as we get into the text, please keep in mind that we are going to examine the book of Philippians according to the following outline. So number one, our first point is going to be Paul's greeting. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul and Tim Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The greeting sent to this church resembled the greetings that Paul sent to other first century uh, churches in, in their letters. It contains three elements. Identification of the writers, identification of the readers, and the greeting. One thing to note, the greeting reveals that Paul chose to write this in a letter format. Epistles can be formal or informal, and Philippians is an informal letter. It is not systematic, which just means that much of the writing just flowed from Paul's mind. At no place in this epistle did Paul sustain a fully developed systematic presentation. I read this letter, that I read this, that, that this letter is theology in street clothes which indicates Paul answered the Philippians' specific concerns in ways that they all could understand. Since Philippians is primarily a practical letter, you will find little historical reference in this book. In fact, there are no Old Testament quotes in the book of Philippians. So let's start with verse, verse 3. Read with me verses 3 through 8. Paul says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. In view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. Since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. I notice in verse 3 how personal this thank you uh, is for Paul. He says, I thank my God. Paul is using a personal pronoun to express aff affection and next he says, in all my remembrance of you. Paul's thankfulness never wavered. It was every time I remember you. Paul's unwavering gratitude continues into verse 4. He says, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. He is stating that he is pleased with all who are in this church. Note the phrase, with joy, and its positioning in the sentence. It modifies the verb phrase, always offering, which strongly supports Paul's appreciation for the relationship that he has with this church. Paul is saying, every time I remember you, he has reason to be thankful and filled with joy. We see in verse 5 a continuation of the consistency of Paul's thankfulness. He states, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. The word participation infers that Paul was in partnership or close fellowship with this church in sharing the gospel and it began the very first day. The relationship between Paul and the church went deeper than most friendships. They had a tie that came from joining in the work of God in the world. Such cooperation in the spread of the gospel 
was something that Paul appreciated very much. So let's look at the thankful and thankfulness and confidence noted in verse 6. Paul says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. James Boyce writes the following, Philippians 1.6 is perhaps one of the three greatest verses in the Bible that teach the doctrine of perseverance of the saints. The doctrine that no one whom God has brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ will ever be lost. People lack that perseverance, but God does not. So I ask you, have you been born again by the Spirit of God? If you're here tonight or watching online and you admit that you don't know Him, I pray that God will use His Word to melt your heart with His grace tonight. But if you are born again, think about this. You never need to fear that you will ever be lost. Why? Because our confidence is not in ourselves. It is He who calls us. It is He who leads us in the Christian life. And He will most certainly lead us home. And in the case you were wondering what the other two passages that Boyce talked about uh, concerning the doctrine of perseverance, they are John 10, 27 and 28 and Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul's thankfulness in these verses stems from his confidence that God would work in the individual Christian until the day of Christ. This confidence occurred for two reasons. First, Paul was confident that God began what he would complete, or he began that God began and He would complete it. The second, Paul saw the manifestations of the Philippians' right relationship with God. Their gift evidenced their Christian maturity, and since God worked in them and they responded, Paul's confidence was justified. We see in verse 7 another cherished special declaration. Paul says, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. When Paul puts it this way, Paul's thanksgiving was more than a response to the gift that they sent and to the knowledge of God's working in their behalf. It came from a true blending of hearts. Emotional ties bound together In the latter part of verse 7, Paul proceeds with other reasons why he has a close relationship with the Philippians. Since both in my imprisonment, this is Paul, and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of grace with me. Paul's imprisonment did not hinder their relationship. Being a prisoner could have presented an obstacle to their wholehearted support but according to some commentaries, they appeared to have the attitude that this was their imprisonment too. No, no doubt this was very meaningful to Paul because the church at Rome was divided into two groups concerning him. The church division will be discussed in the next section under the heading of Paul's circumstances. Paul says in verse 7, in the, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. The defense and confirmation of the gospel directly relates to grace. The gospel is the foundation on which a Christian stands. And the Philippians were fully on board participating in this ministry with Paul. Verse 8 states another reason for Paul's strong association with the Philippians. For God is my witness, how I long for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. In this, ver in this verse, Paul is making a statement in the form of an oath. It's as if Paul called God to the stand, to the witness stand. And Paul expressed the fact that his feelings came from 
Christ Jesus. Verses 9 through 11 are the last part of Paul's greeting and Paul's prayer moved from thanksgiving to petitioning. Paul prayed for a growing love and for complete character in the Philippians. So let's move on to the second point in our outline, Paul's circumstance. So let's look at chapter 1, verses 12 through 17. Read with me. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment is the cause of Christ, in the cause of Christ, has become well known throughout the whole praetorium guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. Paul does not describe his hardships in detail, but he does provide us with divine perspective that all events were being used for the Lord's purposes. We know that Paul's primary concern was that the gospel go forward and even if the advancement of the gospel had to occur through adverse circumstances, Paul was still joyful. In verses 13 and 14, Paul says that his imprisonment was for the cause of Christ and his predicament was because of the Christian message that he was proclaiming. One other result that was mentioned by Paul in verse 14, that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Paul saw that his sharing of the gospel under adverse conditions was the catalyst for renewed interest in outreach, and he knew this would be good news to the church in Philippi. In verses 15 through 17, Paul described two groups of preachers who reacted to his circumstances. The so-called Christian brothers in these two groups included those supportive and those opposed to Paul. Those opposed to Paul sought to elevate themselves at Paul's expense. Their insincere preaching intended to bring greater affliction to him. In contrast, in verses 16 and 17, Paul described his supporters' motivations. They preached from goodwill and love. These relational terms contrast with the descriptions of the opponents. Those of goodwill directed their support toward Paul just as the others directed their animosity toward him. The next nine verses represent what Paul was feeling regarding his circumstances. So beginning in verse 18, beginning in verse 18, we are still in chapter 1 and we only have a couple hours to go. So, Verse 18, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ proclaimed, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that in with all boldness Christ will even now as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, and I do not know which to choose. I am hard-pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for that is very much better yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. 
Paul's situation caused deep contemplation. His concerns were twofold. The outcome of his imprisonment and his trial, and then the possibility of death. These verses reveal the tension in Paul's life. The tribulation he endured reached its pinnacle as he waited for his trial. One author said, In many ways, this was Paul's finest hour for the gospel. The commitments which drove him in his life now kept him as he contemplated his death. Even in the midst of such deep reflection, Paul is optimistic. He would be saved. Christ would be glorified one way or the other, and the gospel would go forth. Paul expected to continue his ministry after the trial. He contemplated what could happen and how he would respond to the worst of situations. If he went to be with the Lord, his Lord, he would triumph. If he stayed with the Philippians, they would be helped. But as he understood the work of the Lord, he would remain to further their faith. So let's move on to the third point in our outline, which is Paul's exhortation. We're going to look at the next six verses, chapter 1, verse 27, through, verse, through chapter 2, verse 2. Chapter 1, Paul says, only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me, and now you hear to be in me. Chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any con consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. So let's take a look at these last six verses that we read. In the first section of instructions, Paul urged the church to be true to the faith. His directive was to walk worthily of the gospel of Christ. The need to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel and standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith, were important elements. The church in Rome stood for the gospel, but there was no unity. And Paul knew that the lack of unity severely hinders the witness of the church. The Philippians had the opportunity to witness to the world by their unified stance in the gospel. This would, make, this would have a significant impact if they stood strong through the sufferings that they were called to endure. The next major area of exhortation begins in chapter 2, verse 3. Humility is the theme of this next group of passages. So let's look back at the text, beginning in chapter 2, verse 3. We're going to go down through verse 11. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul begins this section by instructing others to con constructing them to consider others and their personal interests as more important as their own interests. Humility begins with a realistic appraisal of oneself and others as being made in the image of God. And Christ's humility is the standard for evaluating the worth of others and our actions toward Him. Verses 6 through 11 is the classic Christology path, Christological passage in the New Testament dealing with Christ's incarnation, His humility, and His obedience. And for many, verses 6 through 11 are referred to as a hymn to Christ. Now we come to verses 12 through 18. Paul has identified and applied what he considered the central thrust of Jesus' attitude, which was obedience. Starting in verse 12, going through 18. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory because I did not run in vain nor toil in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. You too, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy with me. For Paul, obedience was the primary responsibility of the church and an essential compo component of Christian living. These verses that we just read have three actions in them. First, the Philippians were to devote themselves to practical Christianity by working out their salvation. Second, they were to be characterized by positive steadfastness, never succumb succumbing to complaining or grumbling. And finally, they were to participate in Paul's personal joy in ministry, not only rejoicing with him, but sharing with him in his convictions. There is a break in Paul's directives uh, in the remaining verses of chapter 2, which is the fourth point in our outline. Paul is describing his companions, Timothy and Epaphroditus. In verses 19 to 24, it contains a, it, they contain very high commendations for Timothy. Knowing that he could not visit Philippi, Paul hoped to send Timothy. Simply stated, Paul is planning to send Timothy because he was like-souled or like-minded. And the NIV says it this way, I have no one else like him. Some have questioned whether Paul meant Timothy was like Paul, but all, but all the evidence suggests that Timothy was a partner in ministry, sharing Paul's commitments and his burdens. And apparently for Timothy to live was, was Christ as well, and he conducted his fair affairs in that way. Timothy's worth was also found in his commitment to Paul. Timothy took care of Paul as though Timothy was a natural son. The dangers that he endured in that service, such as at Philippi when Silas and Paul were beaten and thrown into prison, proved Timothy's genuineness, even in life-threatening situations. Paul pointed out that though Timothy served as a son, his primary commitment was to the gospel and not to Paul. In verses 25 through 30, Paul sends a similar style commendation for Epaphroditus as he had in the previous verses for Timothy. 
Paul expressed a fondness and a deep appreciation for him. Epaphroditus was a brother, a fellow worker, and a fellow soldier. Epaphroditus' service had been a gift from the church to Paul. He came with news of the church's love and a gift for them from them. And in fact, the trip to Rome almost almost killed or took Epaphroditus' life. But he was determined to stay and care for Paul once he got to Rome. We need to remember at this time that it had been four years since the Philippians had seen Paul. And they heard rumors of all kinds of things that had happened to him. And they were worried. So we now move on to chapter 3 and our fifth point in our outline. Paul is warning, Paul's warning to the church. Paul turned his thoughts more directly to the false teachers and to Christian living. We will not read from chapter 3, but as a reminder, Philippians contains a mixture of instruction and exhortation, and in chapter 3, these commands are predominant again. They continue into chapter 4 to verse 10, where Paul thanked the Philippians for their gifts to him. In these passages, two concerns occupied Paul's mind about the false teachers. First, certain persons had attempted to undermine his ministry. And second, the problem of disunity demanded one final appeal, and Paul provided it with more direct and confrontational language. One commentary says this about how Paul addressed the false teachers in verses 3, 1 through 16. He says, Paul had traveled the road the false teachers traveled. In this passage, Paul drew on his theological pilgrimage. He knew the weaknesses of a legalistic approach to salvation, and he knew the joys of coming to God through Christ. In his career, he had experienced both, and he knew that one excluded the other. A subtle danger, however, was that the threat that some would become legalistic Christians. And in their enthusiasm, they would hold together two polar theologies, their untrained theological minds allowing them to practice what threatened the existence of the church they loved. The best means of countering both for Paul was to explain his experience prior to his salvation. Still in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, Paul continued to warn the church about the false teachers. He implicitly describes them as unbelievers, enemies of the cross. Their citizenship was on earth and not in heaven. Structurally, after an introductory statement setting the direction for these verses, Paul described the opponents and then contrasted them with true believers in verses 20 and 21 and on to, into chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 20 says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. What an awesome commendation by the Apostle Paul to them and also to us. So moving on to uh, verses 2 through 6 in chapter 4, we come to the sixth point in our outline, Paul's admonition. Verse 2, I urge Euodia and I urge Sintishi to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul's opening verse in chapter 4, in his, his opening verse, it's obvious that Paul has immediately changed his tone. Chapter 3 contains the emotion of argumentation, and now he spoke with a, warm, a warmth of a dear friend. He made three st statements about his close relationship to the church. He addressed them as beloved brethren. He said he loved and longed for them. And thirdly, Paul called them his joy and crown. He did not mean that they had replaced the joy of the Lord, but rather that life was better because he knew them. They brought him joy even while he was awaiting trial. In verses 2 and 3, Paul addressed the problem of unity. Because the problem is mentioned with specific individuals involved, it can be assumed that it was more than just a passing disagreement. It had the potential of splitting the church into two groups. The controversy occurred between two notable women who played a major part or a major role in the church. Whatever the cause, several factors emerge about the problem. It was significant enough that the women might not be able to solve it themselves, and it was divisive enough to cause the church to write to Paul about it. The entire church was then asked to intercede on behalf of these two women. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 4 through 6, speaks primarily to those occasions in life when peace is lacking, when trials interrupt our lives. Paul gave three commands to help the readers solve these problems. He commanded the Philippians to rejoice. Their joy was to be in the Lord, and it was to be unchanging. Second, Paul exhorted them to gentleness. Commentators constantly or consistently insist that the word gentleness contains an element of selflessness. The gentle person does not insist on his own rights. The third command is negative, but it has a positive thrust. Do not be anxious about anything. The point is, is that prayer relieves the problem of anxiety. The center of verse 6 is, is the significant part. Prayer is to be offered with thanksgiving. The attitude of gratitude accompanies all true approaches to our Father. Verses 7, 8, and 9 unite around the theme of peace. Verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. The answer to anxiety is the peace of God. We see in verse 7, Paul says, it is the peace of God. It's, it is a divine peace. This peace also transcends, transcends all understanding. And finally, this peace will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The word guard is a military term implying that peace stands on duty to keep out anything that brings worry or anxiety. So we move on to the seventh point in our outline. Paul's gratitude. Paul is commending the church's financial support and thanked the Philippians for remembering him and his needs as they had before. 
its support that was its support that was unique. It's the only Macedonian church that supported him. Paul shared one of the reasons he remembered the Philippians fondly, and that was from the first day until now. He remembered that when they first heard the gospel, they saw its implications for others and shared in its expansion. Since Paul committed his life to the progress of the gospel and measured his success, success by the proclamation of the gospel, their giving fostered a natural friendship. Paul's commendation led him to speak of how the Philippians benefited from supporting him. He understood well that a genuine, genuine giver seeks no personal benefits. Paul lived that way, and so did they. Verse 17, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. Giving brings blessings to both the giver and the receiver. Lastly, the eighth point in our outline is Paul's farewell. Paul's farewell implored the grace of God. In verse 23, he ended like he began with a prayer for grace. It is significant that the final line should be grace. Paul reminded them that everything good they had was because of God's grace. So what is Paul's message in the book of Philippians? Paul knew that inexpressible and uncontrolled joy is a result of the presence of God being imprinted on the soul. Paul had a deep feeling of peace and calmness, of contentment, contentment and satisfaction that pours out of the pre presence of God. Paul was filled with joy in spite of his circumstances. Please know that Paul's message is clear for both the redeemed and those who do not know Christ. Joy is produced by the Holy Spirit. You begin by dealing with the sin in your life, confessing it to the Lord, fully submitting your life to Christ as your Lord and Savior, yielding to the Spirit of God and letting the Spirit produce joy in your life. For those of us who are in Christ, the fact that you've been given a new life in Christ with new holy affections and a desire for obedience, the fact that you've been placed in this church alongside other believers should cause you to be constantly filled with what? Joy with joy. Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May God's grace be with you all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for allowing us to see Paul's heart in writing this book to the Philippians. We can see how grace impacted his life and we know how grace impacts ours. And so we are so privileged to know you, so privileged to have the Holy Spirit in us, desiring you, wanting more of you each and every day. And so we thank you for this time, Father. Thank you so much for the gift of grace. In your name we pray, amen.